I'm the Director of Research for the European Futures Observatory. It's um, an independent think tank based in the UK. Um, we're engaged in a number of projects at the moment, and because I'm the Director of Research, I have a little bit of input in all of them and a big input in none of them. So I sort of, you know, I'm, I'm more of a generalist on it. Um, the two really large projects that we're working on right now, one is um, we call America 2025, which is looking at US foreign policy out to the year 2025 and what the various po foreign policy options are likely to be within that time frame. The second project that we're working on, uh, which once again is a fairly large project, is looking at the social boundaries to technological development, which is um, we're tending to focus on specific technologies rather than taking a broad brush approach to it. Um, at, at, at the moment, we're doing a, a reasonable amount of work in the area of biotech for one of the government agencies in the UK who are responsible for licensing, uh, experimentation licenses, things like that. And they're, um, they're interested in what technologies which are feasible will also be morally acceptable. Because at the point of licensing, um, saying that this experiment can go ahead and this experiment can't go ahead, they have to try and gauge what harm would be done to the public body now, but also in the future as well. And so we have, um, they have a number of horizon uh, scanners looking at sort of like technologies 20 or 30 years out, and they come up with all sorts of wonderful things that could happen in the future. Um, but that doesn't really help them with the question of, well, is that technology, even though it's feasible, is it morally acceptable? Are the public willing to support and allow that uh, technology to be adopted? And so that, that's one of the things that we're involved in at the moment, doing some research into that. What are some examples of those technologies that are... Uh, okay. Um, very good question. Um, in, in terms of, for example, cloning, okay, is it morally acceptable for there to be a clone of me specifically grown so that we can harvest the organs when the organs in my body start to wear out. Um, if we were to go ahead with that clone, would that clone have human rights? Would it be a human? Um, a, a, another example uh, we have is where a, 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 bit of, um, a bit of the human DNA is used to genetically uh, create um, a, a donor animal, such as a pig, specifically for a heart valve. And you then have a, a heart operation to replace a valve in the heart, and you're given a pig's valve, which you know won't be rejected because you've got that sort of DNA compatibility within it, okay? Does that make you any less of a person because you're part pig? And, you know, it's a really interesting question there about, well, what does it mean to be human? What, what, does, what is humanity about? And that's, that's where we have really interesting conversations with people like the transhumanists. I don't know if you've come across them, but um, they're people who believe that the, the human is, um, that the, the, uh, the human form is on the, in the process of evolving into something else. And part of it's sort of like the kind of Nietzschean superhuman, and part of it's the kind of Terminator-type cyborg, where, you know, sort of... And uh, we're actually quite comfortable with that technology. We, uh, most of us know somebody who's got a pacemaker, which is actually just a mechanical device to kind of keep, you know, the heart working as it should. So, you know, we're, we're, we're quite comfortable with kind of cyborg technology, but it's sort of like, it, it, it's making, you know, a much greater percentage of the human is actually machine. And that's really where the sort of, the, the transhumanists are sort of coming, coming from. But um, they're, they're looking at, um, 
how, how that would be achieved, what would it mean? Should we have separate um, human rights for different types of people? And you know, and that, that's a complete and total political minefield given the history, the recent history that we have in Europe. It's a really sensitive area, but it's an area that technology might actually force us to look at because you know, people, people will, there will be different types of people. And, and that's in the not too distant future. So those are the sorts of things that we're looking at in that project. But normally that project starts with a specific technology and then we generalize outwards. Whereas the, uh, the, the American uh, foreign policy, we're looking at the most general level and we're trying to avoid becoming specific because we're really interested in general conclusions. To these, these questions about technology, are you finding answers or options or just more questions? There are no, there are no answers. I'm a firm believer that there are no answers. Um, I'm a firm believer that the best that we can come up with are difficult choices for our masters to make. And at the end of the day, we don't have a public mandate. The, the politicians have the public mandate. All that we can do is put before them the options and they have to make the hard choices. That's what they signed up for when they put themselves up for election. So I'm not sure if that answers your question. It does. Yeah. It really does. Um, what, why did you come to this conference? What sort of what, um, I, I, I came because I was invited. Um, I, I met Jerry uh, Paffendorf in Miami um, at the uh, APF conference, and he said, uh, come along and have a real blast. So I thought, yeah, that sounds okay. And I met John Smart at the WFS conference in Chicago, and John said, hey, it's great, you're coming along. And, and I was kind of wondering, why, why am I here, you know, exactly why am I here? And the penny dropped this morning. It's actually the first guy who spoke. Was it Vernon Vinge? Yep. Yeah. He the penny dropped during his presentation because much of the work that we're doing in the field of technology is about ensuring that we have a soft takeoff rather than a hard takeoff. It's trying to move the odds of um, a negative disruption caused by technology, it's trying to move the odds in our favour so that we can actually manage it and the change becomes easier to cope with rather than just a, 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 you know, a completely horrible change that happens overnight. And so I, I, I think that the one thing that I'll probably take away from the conference is that we do actually have a choice about the rate at which technology changes and that we can actually influence the pace of it um, and that perhaps, you know, this is where we get into an opinion that perhaps we ought to try and do as little harm as possible and so that we ought to try to manage the future so that if, even if we disagree what the desired outcomes are, we all agree that we should do it with as little disruption or as little adverse disruption as possible. So that, that's what I'm going to take away from it. Many of the people we've talked to already have said that sort of the hard takeoff is inevitable. Mm. You say that you, know, you think we can control it. Explain yes. that a little bit. Well, I, uh, perhaps it's because of the work that we're doing in the UK in terms of um, <laughs> experimentation can't just simply happen. Um, in Europe, we have a thing called the precautionary principle, which is that in order for a new product or a new technology to come onto the market, the vendors of the product have to show that it does no harm. Whereas the American approach is slightly different. There, the new product comes onto the market, and if it causes harm, then you have class action lawsuits. So in, in Europe, you have to show that it's safe, Whereas in the US, you have to show that harm's been done. And I think that affects the nature of how people handle the risks of new technology. And because of that, um, we, it, because the precautionary principle allows us to uh, find ourselves in a position 
where we license the development of technology, it means that you can actually control the pace of it. And so, f for example, I, 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 I'll give you an example of um, perhaps one of the things that I'm thinking of. Um, my, Microsoft now has to sell a European edition where the internet browser is unbundled because they had a fairly short lawsuit with the European Commission. The European Commission found that the practices of Microsoft were anti-competitive and that one of the conditions for Microsoft selling into the European market would be that it had to sell, in addition to the sort of uh, the Windows product that sold generally, they also had to have an unbundled product as well where consumers could choose to take the unbundled product and put their own web browsers on. And the choice for Microsoft was either you sell the unbundled product or you have to give your source code to all of the other you know, so software houses. And obviously Microsoft decided that unbundled is a lot, you know, they're going to lose less by unbundling it than, you know, sort of like giving away the crown jewels for free. So, um, but that's, that's one way where um, sort of the, the, the legislative approach to technological development has actually slowed things down a little bit. I've said, well, hang on a minute, let's take a step back. Let's just, you know, have a little think about where we want to go in this. Um, and so... I, you know, I have great respect for the, you know, hard takeoff people. I'm sure they know a great deal more about it than I do, but I feel that in our little corner of the world, that we can actually um, adjust the pace of change. Um, perhaps another example would be uh, GM crops, which um, in 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 the U.S. GM crops, I believe, are you know, widely purchased in supermarkets and you know you know, generally for sale. Whereas, particularly in the UK, the public won't buy GM products. If you use any form of GM product, you have to put it on the label on the outside. The supermarkets have stopped stocking them because they can't sell them. That's right. And that's, once again, another example of where social pressure has acted as a break on technology by saying, well, hang on a minute, you know, you might want, you know, you guys might want to go for a hard takeoff, but we're not really going to follow suit. We're going to have a little think about this. Um, we need to make sure that, you know, the genetically modified food is actually safe. And these are safety issues. I mean, scientifically, the, the public could be talking a load of rubbish. I mean, you know, that could be the case. But they believe, the public generally believes that they're not sure whether it's safe or not. And that one of the problems that I think that um, science faces in the UK specifically, possibly more widely across Europe, is that the public just doesn't trust scientists. A scientist will stand up and say, yeah, this is great, this is safe, you can use it. And people think, hang on, they said that about um, BSE. And, you know, and all of the things where the scientists weren't, were actually wrong tend to come to the public mind. And so um, I, th I think that's part of the sort of um, process by which there is this break on the development of technology. And every now and then, the public will apply the brakes. And they do it by simply not buying the products. What, what scares you about the future? I'm an optimist. I'm not scared about the future. I mean, even, um, what's the worst thing that could happen? Even if an asteroid hit the planet, okay, um, if I were to survive, if I didn't survive, well, you know, that, that would answer a different question that I have. But if I were to survive, then, you know, we'd muddle through. And, and that's very much the sort of the British way of doing things. You know, something bad happens, well, you know, we'll muddle through. Um, you, you look at all of the key sort of turning points in British history, and it's always the same. Something bad happens, well, we'll muddle through, and we come through in the end. And so I'm, I'm not really scared about a great deal, actually. Um, you know, perhaps that's not the answer that you wanted, but it, it, it's, yeah. What haven't we talked about that you think is important? What haven't we talked about that I think is important? Ooh. Um, I don't really want to get into politics, but 
I think that one of the really important things for the future is um, the American psyche is going to have to reevaluate itself. That's going to be a very, very, very painful process. Um, that's um, that's that that that's uh, that's not a subject for polite conversation between friends. Uh, you know, the, you know, while, while I'm a guest here, I don't think I really want to talk too much about it. But I think that that's a really big issue that's on the to-do list sooner or later. Is it something that is going to have to happen? Do you think because? something's going to force it to change, or are people going to have to make a conscious decision to act differently? I think that there are a number of mutually exclusive trends that are in play at the moment, and that the longer the American public, either in their personal lives or through the uh, public manifestation of their lives in the political arena, um, the, the, the longer these issues are not resolved, the harder the resolution will be when it comes to the crunch. And, you know, an, an, an obvious, an obvious um, issue that we're looking at here, for example, is oil. Um, I, 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 at the moment, I, when, when I first arrived here, I there was some discussion on the TV that the president could um, temporarily relieve the petrol pump prices by temporarily suspending the federal tax on fuel. And so I thought that's a good idea, that's what they're suggesting in the UK, but it turns out that it's 15 cents a gallon, which means that instead of talking about 280 a gallon, we're talking about 270, 265, 270 a gallon, which, you know, isn't really going to make a major impact. Whereas in the UK, um, about, I believe it's about half the petrol pump price is tax. So there's a lot more leeway, but it's actually acted to protect the British consumer against oil prices because the oil price in absolute terms is a smaller percentage and so it hasn't hurt so much as it has over here and that's one of these issues that will need resolution one way or another because it's just not sustainable in its in in, in the present form um, the you know what wh what is the price of oil I mean there are those who would argue that um, are, you, are you comfortable with the term CENCOM no. oh, okay the, the U.S. Army's got different commands around the world. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. CENCOM is the one with the Middle East. Yes. Okay. In one scenario that we're looking at where the issue of oil consumption and energy usage in the U.S. isn't dealt with, we're looking at CENCOM for the next 20 years not having fewer than 150,000 active troops under arms. Okay. And the question I put to you is, well, how are you going to pay for it? At the moment, your friends in the Chinese, the Japanese, the South Korean central banks are quite happy to pay for it. But what's going to happen if they want their money back? I mean, you know, one of the adjustment mechanisms would be interest rates. How high would interest rates have to go in order to, con uh, to allow people to continue with their existing energy consumption uses, the, 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 the consumption patterns that they have at present? And that's a, that's a really um, difficult issue. And the longer it remains unresolved, the harder it will be to resolve it. Because if we're talking about the arena of $100 a barrel, then your, le your, 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 your leeway for action is a lot less than at $25 a barrel. And so the, the, that's an example of one of the things that I think that, and it, 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 it if anything were to bother me, it would be sort of people um, perhaps realizing the consequences of their actions, that we make choices today that have an impact on the future. And what might be a good idea today will have a very bad impact on the future. And people seem to discount the future and say, well, you know, we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. But unfortunately, the present sometimes crashes into the future. 
I think the current oil spike is one of those issues where the present has crashed in the present has crashed into a future problem. And we're now seeing a little bit of what the future might hold for us if we don't actually sort of change 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 our behaviour today. But like I said, that's that's a contentious issue. Um, there are people who disagree with what I say. So. All right. mm. Anything else you want to talk about? No, I, I'm fine. Yeah. Hopefully I've given you enough material for you to yeah. find interesting. So. Yeah, thanks for chatting with us. Yeah, it's, it's my pleasure. It's, um, yeah. it's an opportunity to make a contribution rather than just to simply receive.